talk tonight i have julia nelson she's an entrepreneur and an author and some of her business ventures include a publishing company and an eyewear um, line so i'm really excited to have juliet here today thank you for being with us juliet welcome thank you for having me so first thing i want to ask you about is when did you know that you were going to be an entrepreneur Honestly, I didn't want to be an entrepreneur. Um, So to say that I knew, um, I'd be lying by saying that personally, I knew it would be a lot of work and I I worked a lot um, knowing my personality. I didn't care for it. Um, I actually went on a spiritual fast and I was kind of asking God for answers to questions I knew I had no business asking for. Um, And out of that fast came Junuri, which was the first company where um, a business part, my business partner, um, he, you know, we were just brainstorming on different ideas. And he was like, you know, I'm going to make a website for you. And I said, no, you're not kind of like, don't tell me what to do. I'll tell you when I need a website. (laughs) And I ended up, uh, um, this was around like Christmas time. So I ended up spending Christmas Eve with some friends and one of them, um, is like a mentor. And I was again, bouncing ideas off of them. And they're like, you have all of these skills and you're going through people right now to perform those skills. Why not just do it under your own umbrella? So between the conversation with my business partner and, you know, speaking with friends who are like family, you know, in like within like the same week, that's what birthed the vision, the mission, um, part of the purpose that created Junuri and the rest is history. So what were you doing before you launched yourself into entrepreneurville? Um, I was, I was a tutor. Um, I, I was actually doing it through an agency, but the, the learning solutions that I provide my students are very, very different from that of an average tutor. So I'm not just coming in and helping them with homework, but I'm really identifying their learning needs. And then they have like a whole learning plan. So oftentimes it's me teaching them you know, or sometimes even reteaching what they weren't able to grasp in school. And then also identifying some of, you know, their opportunities for improvement. So for example, if a kid has trouble with, you know, understanding math problems, maybe it might just be a reading comprehension issue, or maybe they might not know how to, you know, pull out their sight words. So I basically take a holistic view of what their learning opportunities are, and then I would apply it. So that's what I was doing as a tutor going through an agency. Um, At the time, I was also a choir director. I was directing four choirs at that time, two children's choirs, a youth choir, and a church or adult choir. So, you know, there was a lot of skill and experience as well in leadership and getting people together and, and so on and so forth. So, and of course, I had my nine to five. So, yeah. Wow. Okay. So tell us about January. Is that your very first business? And um, you told us a little bit about how it came about, but tell us exactly what it is and what you're doing. Right. So January is a learning and development um, company. We provide learning and development services for professionals and students. So for students, it can be anywhere from um, tutoring um, or educating, I would say, Um, academic um, coaching, um, you know, proofreading and editing on academic projects, presentation preparation. For professionals, we would do resume building, interview preparation, job preparation. We do work with uh, small businesses as well. So depending on their needs, we work with them in addressing, you know, some of their needs, um, whether it's building a business plan, getting a team together or even managing, you know, the, the small staff that they have. So um, we, we have a, a nice range, but the goal is to facilitate learning and development in some sense for our clients. Okay. What would you say has been the hardest part of transitioning into entrepreneurship for you? The hardest part. And honestly, I, I wouldn't even know the hardest part because I didn't even think about it. 
I just went into it. It um, unfortunately, I the way I guess the way I function, um, and I admit I am a workaholic. Um, the way I function, I tend to just go on autopilot. So it's a project I got to go and I'm going to do it. And then maybe at the very end, I'll process it. Nevertheless, I think the hardest part was, I guess now that I think about it, maybe the hardest part was really telling myself that it's okay to take my time. It's really prioritizing what's, what are we going to do first and what is okay to, you know, wait until a year from now or six months from now or whatever the case may be. And so I think in the beginning, it was extremely challenging figuring out what I wanted to prioritize versus what I could just leave for later. And I wanted to do everything at the same time. But, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs will will know that, you know, we start a business and the way you started the business is oftentimes what it may not end up be, becoming in the very end. So yeah. I would say that was the biggest challenge. Definitely. That's definitely um, a challenge. <laughs> right, right. So what would you say now that you've been in the business, how long have you had this business? Junuri, I've had it actually last month. Uh, we celebrated three years. I didn't even realize that. Oh, wow. Three years. Yeah. Yeah. You're just working and not even. I am. <laughs> you I don't even. <laughs> no, you got to celebrate those milestones. Right, right. <laughs> it's not even clicking in. Um, but yeah, we celebrated three years. Wow. So now that you're three years in, what are some of your daily struggles as an entrepreneur? You know, you're juggling a lot. You have a lot going on. What are some things that jump out at you? I wouldn't call them. I mean, they are struggles, but I don't like to call them struggles. I like to call them um, challenges Mm -hmm. um, because I know I can overcome them versus a struggle. You know, that's something that might consume you more. Yeah. Uh, but I think my biggest challenge, I would say, is finding balance. And it looks different um, depending on the day, depending on the week, depending on the month and depending on the year. Mm-hmm. It changes. Um, but the balance is the key thing. Currently, it's three companies. I do have a fourth. Um, and, you know, we have a social media presence, but we're working on a very big launch. And of course, COVID happened. So that kind of um, forced us to re-strategize. But um, yeah, we ha- I have a, f- so it's four companies technically. And then um, I am working on my doctorate. So I'm currently working on my dissertation for oh my school. Gosh. Um, and Damn. the quarter just started as we're speaking. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so um, that's that. And I do have my full-time job. I do. So you're so, still working full-time I and am working. running Oh my gosh, it that is yeah. I do not recommend anyone try this at home. You know, some people do it, but I, it it's it's very very challenging. I will say it's not easy, but the biggest challenge is always how am I finding balance today right now? So one of the things that has worked for me is writing a to-do list. I'm very big on goals and milestones and like organization. I love order and once I, once I'm in a place where I'm functioning reactively or too reactively or in a place where it's just too much chaos, it's difficult for me because I love order and organization. So what I like to do is set goals. Like these are the, the general goals. And then I have milestones because when I have shorter milestones, I can celebrate those milestones and it, it feels like I'm making progress. For example, I know the winter was a very challenging time with me, for me. And I realize I feed off of good weather. So if it's like cloudy and rainy and dreary, I just, you know, you don't feel like getting out of bed. And I live in the Northeast, so it gets cold. You really don't feel like doing much. You feel like just stay, staying in your covers and, and, you know, for me watching Netflix. Of course, I don't have that luxury. So what I started doing is, in the morning, writing, actually writing out a to-do list. And sometimes that to-do list is eat breakfast. Sometimes it's get out of bed. Um, Sometimes it's brush your teeth. And even though it's it's part of my routine, I'm going to do it anyway. But the fact that I did that, it's something I can celebrate. And so when I see that it's on a to-do list and I accomplish something, it gives me enough fuel to now go and accomplish something bigger. On my to-do list, it can be send an email. Um, but I know that that helps me to work toward bigger goals. I also write affirmations in the morning. So these affirmations, it's not 
um, in the sense of I'm going to be a millionaire or, um, you know, I'm living in a mansion with my husband and two dogs or something. But it's very much affirming some of the behaviors I would like to emulate to step into eventually, you know, what I would love to ultimately become. So, you know, whether it's my company making a number of sales, maybe for me, it could be, you know, um, I am brainstorming one or two ideas for the eyewear company. For me, you know, becoming healthy is a big priority for me. That's one of my biggest goals. So one of my affirmations is me getting a number of sleep every night, me speaking to my parents, me drinking a gallon of water every day. And so with those affirmations, even though I may not have done them every single day in the morning, but now they're just second nature to me because I was speaking that into myself. And by doing so, I'm able to achieve, you know, the balance that I look for. Um, So yeah, um, that's, that's one of the things that I use to tackle finding balance. And again, it changes. Sometimes it's using my calendar. Other times in the year, it's writing on a notepad. Other times it's using, you know, a software on my computer. Um, But yeah. Mm, I like it. How are you doing with the gallon of water? I actually have a gallon of water next to me now. Um, Mm. (laughs) I... I, um, so I got a gallon of water. I mean, today I had a late start, but I got a gallon of water off of Amazon and it actually has the different times of the day. So at 7 a.m., good morning, 9 a.m., hydrate yourself, 11 a.m., remember your goal and so on and so forth until you get to the end of the gallon. And I love that again, because it has milestones. Right. So every time I achieve a milestone or get to another level, I'm like, okay, I can keep going. It's ammunition for me to keep going. Granted, when I, in the beginning, when I got to five o'clock, when it said, don't give up, I would give up. But now it's like, no, you're at five o'clock. You just have like a couple more to go, a couple more rounds to go push through to nine o'clock and get to the end of the gallon. So yeah, it works for me and I love it. Now, if I don't have a gallon of water every day or if a certain time of the day comes and I haven't consumed enough water, my body will tell me like you are thirsty, extremely thirsty. Mm, yeah. I'm going to have to look for that bottle. I might, mm-hmm. I might need that. <laughs> I'll send you the link. Thank you. So you are also the co-founder and chief business development officer of, is it Voyzer or? Voisin. Okay. Wazen. <laughs> it's a Creole term, Haitian Creole for neighbor. Okay. Yes. yes. All right. So tell us a little bit about that organization and what you're doing there. Yeah. So Wazen is actually a Haitian Creole language learning management system. And it's, it's a project that I'm very excited for, and it's taken a little bit longer than we expected, but I think that adds to the excitement because it takes a lot of effort and a lot of brain power. But basically my, my business partner and I, we identified just a challenge and a need where there are limited resources, at least for for example, a heritage speaker, um, a Haitian American like myself, who was born in the United States, but has parents born in Haiti. And there are not as many resources for us to learn Haitian Creole in a comprehensive manner. Now, I was an English teacher in South Korea. And so I've been able to understand and, and really grasp the art of teaching someone a language. And I think what happens is when we learn foreign languages, we just memorize them. We don't really try to approach them from a comprehensive um, lens. So um, we, and we also identified a challenge where in Haiti, while the official language is Haitian Creole, a lot of the material is in French, as French used to be the mother colony during times of slavery and colonization. So you'll find that, you know, a lot of, in a lot of classrooms, French is the primary language spoken. Even with language learning material, if you were born and raised in Haiti, more than likely, you will need to learn French in order to find the French book that will teach you English or Spanish versus having material in Creole 
that will just teach you whatever language. In addition to having a textbook written in Creole that gives you history, that gives you science and so on and so forth. So that being said, my business partner and I really wanted to address those challenges. So we're coming out with a language learning solution. Again, we are on social media, but we are coming out with actually a language management system where you can really go through and learn from A to Z as if you were learning, you know, Spanish or French, you know, in middle school or elementary school back in those days when they turned, I'm pretty sure they, they teach those still, but, you know, just the, the process where you learn how to say hello first, you learn, learn how to introduce yourself and there are some grammatical rules and then they introduce maybe telling time or telling numbers and so on and so forth. So there's a, a learning journey that we're trying to approach where it's more comprehensive and it and it actually stays and lasts longer with the learner in the long term. So, yeah. Wow, I love that. So, do you speak Creole? I do. I do speak fluently. Oh, that's awesome. Yes. I love it. So, why did you choose or I don't even know if this was a choice. Maybe this was just like, you know, a part of your destiny, your passion, but it seems like you do a lot of work around helping students um and people to just learn better, more efficiently. Why do you think you fell into that um line of work? I would say that's very much uh, embedded in my purpose. Mm -hmm. as well as my passion. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a teacher like my father. And I threw the dream away. Um, I tell the story all the time, but I, there were, we had in in the sixth grade, we had like superintendents day and they usually give the kids off, but it's more professional development. I believe a day for teachers to come in. And the next day I remember my classmates and I, we came into school and we're asking our teacher, you know, how was your day off? And the teacher's like, we don't get a day off. You got a day off for that. And I was mortified. I was horrified. And I said, absolutely not. I'm not going to work in this line of work where the students get a day off and the teachers don't for one day of the entire year. And I threw it away. I said, I'm not doing this. But, you know, graduating from college, becoming a children's choir director, teaching kids music. Um, And even teaching them different skills aside from music, teaching them teamwork, teaching them leadership. And then being in South Korea, you know, as an actual classroom teacher and having a great experience, learning to identify students' learning needs and, and seeing how, you know, I could make teaching an experience of my own, how I could show my personality and bond with my students, young and old. And then coming back to the States, you know, becoming a tutor, getting involved, even in a professional manner in in learning and development and training and development. Um, So it, it kind of just all surrounds one thing, learning, growing, evolving. So little by little, I was able to really discover my purpose. And I found that I am a very big lover of learning. I absolutely love to learn. It's something I'm very passionate about, you know, anything I can learn Um, whether it's from a video, a book, whatever it is, I'll soak it in. And so, yeah, I would say that's just very much embedded in my purpose and and my calling and what I'm meant to do on this earth. So you said you taught in South Korea. How was that experience for you? Do you feel like you were welcomed? Did you feel comfortable? Like, tell us a little bit about that. For me, it was awesome. And, you know, I'm black. And so, of course, when you go to a country where your kind doesn't really exist much, uh, you're considered exotic, right? Mm-hmm. Um, now, for me, in, in high school and in college, I'd gone to a predominantly Caucasian white school, mm-hmm. where I was like the only black kid in my class. And I'd experienced racism, and I'd experienced bias. And one thing I had to learn is that especially going to that school, is that the reality is, unfortunately, that level of racism, it's been taught to them, but that's all they know, right? Or the bias, it's been taught to them, that's all they know. And for some of them, you know, the bias would come off innocently, or what they would call as innocently. But again, that's all they know, right? When you're born and raised in something, you Mm -hmm. only emulate all you've known. It takes being willing and open to learn something else that allows you to begin unlearning, you know, bad habits that you learned growing up. Yeah. So going to South Korea, I kind of maintained the same mentality. I never perceived myself to really be experiencing bias or racism. 
And I'm going to speak from my experience because I don't want to be insensitive to others. Mm -hmm. Um, but for me, what I kept in my head is because I heard stories, you know, they're going to touch your hair and they're going to stare. But again, for me, it's like, they've never seen, a lot of them have never seen anything like me. Mm -hmm. They haven't seen my color. It might be something they saw on television. You know what I mean? So even for us, it's, it's, it's human nature. For example, we don't see Santa Claus all the time. Right. But if someone dresses up in in a Santa Claus uniform, shows up to our job or classroom, whatever, what are we going to do? We're going to stare. We're not going to act like he, he's not there because he's not something we see every day, right? We might see it on te- him on television. We see him on books, but it's not something we see every day. And so the same sense, you know, going to South Korea, it was for me, it was, I'm not going to force my culture on them, but I'm really going to try to go and learn. And so as a teacher, especially I, that's how I was able to connect with my students and build really, really good relationships with people, you know, trying to find those things that united us and connected us and then celebrating those things that made us unique or different. You know, one interesting memory is, you know, having, um, I think they used to call it tea time or something where the students were able to bring in snacks and we would just talk and chat and get to know each other because of course they're very interested in speaking with foreigners or English speakers and so there was one time where you know they're trying to plan what snacks they want to bring in and one of them said oh Miss Juliet you don't teacher Juliet you don't like rice like right you like bread and I'm Haitian so we love rice exactly breakfast (laughs) lunch dinner Rice, you know, one year old birthday party, a pizza party isn't a pizza party for a kid without rice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Just to say how much we love rice. So I'm looking at this student like, no, I love rice. What do you mean? And he said, no, you're American. You guys like bread. And I realized that he was probably referring to European people of European descent, Mm -hmm. where you go to France, you go to Italy, you might find more bread than you find rice. Right. And so I had to explain that, no, my parents, yes, I'm American by, by nationality, Mm -hmm. but in terms of my lineage and my heritage, it's Haitian blood running through my veins all the way up to Africa. And we love some rice, you know, we love bread too, but we love some rice. And so even something as simple and funny as that was able to kind of open conversation on some of the things we had in common, right? honorifics, having respect for elders, um, even collectivism, you know, everything being about the community, right? Everything you do is about your community. You go to college, you work hard. It's always to go back and make your parents, your family, your community, your village proud. So those were the things I was able to bond with them on. And Mm -hmm. it really just helped me to build great relationships with great people that I'm still friends with. You know, I've been able to just be friends with some of them till this day, even some of my youngest students, they still reach out to me and they tell me, oh my goodness, I'm learning this in school and I'm learning that. And they might send me their homework to make sure, you know, their English is right. Um, And they might ask me questions about the culture. They might ask me questions about, you know, the political or the social unrest or how we're dealing with the pandemic, but still, you know, it's, it's still a space where they feel comfortable to be themselves because again, we'll connect on the things that we can agree on or that, um, you know, unite us, but also respect each other's differences. So. Yeah, that's great. I'm glad that you had a great experience there and you were able to share your culture and, you know, take in their culture as well. That's right, really right. nice to hear. Um, so you also wrote a book, Sharing My Lens, The College Experience. Yes. What led you to write that book? Um, Long story short, someone had approached me about writing a book. Um, I believe it was 20, uh, the tail end of 2017 going into 2018. We had a preliminary conversation about it, but we put it to the side. So a year passed and I was ready to go back to them and say, okay, let's get started on this book. But I remember, and I I remember where I was and and all that. And I remember hearing a voice at that time saying, wait, you know, it's not your time yet. Number one, you don't even know your testimony. Second of all, that's not the person who's going to tell your story. So I kind of had this like moment where I was just frozen. Okay, what does that mean? And I kid you not, the following month, just life got extremely challenging. 
And this was very much related to my experience as a doctorate student. Mm. And so later on in the year, I was speaking to a mentee of mine and we were just talking about the different, um, just the different things we wish we knew going into college. And this is around the time when, you know, I have my own book editing clients, um, book coaching clients, and I'm also trying to figure out, you know, at which point am I going to tell my story? How am I going to tell my story? What is it going to be like? What is it going to look like? And so on and so forth. And so in having that conversation with that person, it was like a light bulb went off in my head. I'm like, that's it. I'm going to share just the things I wish I knew going into college. And so the book is not fully focused on me. It gives a lot of the gems, but I also share a little bit of my experiences as well, you know, through my college journey. Um, but yeah, that's really what sparked it. And, you know, I, I realized that I was, you know, editing and doing book coaching for other people. And I'm like, you know what, I think I want to do something for myself. And so the thing I did for myself was uh, published a book and I, and I ran it through, you know, Junuri Publishing's process. So, which was very risky, you know, I had to run it through my own editing and I had to run it through my own process to really understand what the publishing process was going to be like and what it was like being my own customer. Mm -hmm. So that I could really say, all right, I'm ready to launch a publishing company. So oh, you are amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So in this climate, what advice would you give to Afro-Caribbean millennial women or just black, you know, students in general, men and women going away to college? Going away to college. Um Number one, know thyself. Take time to really understand who you are, how you function, how you learn, and what your purpose is in life. Ask yourself what you want to do to make an impact, not who you want to be. Because if you go into college saying, I want to be a nurse, I want to be a doctor. I know coming from West Indian parents, you know, everybody want you to be a nurse, a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer. Mm -hmm. You go into college saying, I want to be a nurse. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. You're not going into college saying, I want to help people live a better quality of life. If the nursing or the doctor thing doesn't work out, you throw college away completely because you were only going in for a certain title, but you weren't going in with a purpose. Mm -hmm. So when you're able to understand your purpose and understand your learning style and be okay with it. It allows you more control over your learning experience for college. Another thing I would say is be okay with who you are and, and what you're meant to be. You know, I'm Christian. And so, you know, and I, I was saying this with someone else, when God gives you purpose, he did not have a conference call with everybody else about your purpose, right? Your calling is yours. Your purpose is yours. And whether you believe in God, Buddha, the universe, whatever it is. The reality is there was not a conference call to determine your calling and your purpose, right? It was specifically made for you. Parents, friends, family, yes, they can advise, but at the end of the day, it is your life. It is your future. And so you really have to understand what you are meant to do. And then you can create your learning experience based on that purpose. So again, if you know that you are your purpose is to help people live a better quality of life. Maybe you won't be a nurse, but you might be a fitness instructor. Maybe you might not be a nurse, but you might be a dietitian or a nutritionist, right? So there are different ways to approach it. Yeah, there's a lot of different careers out there, a lot of different ways that you can make your dreams come true. It's not just always right, right. a straight path. Yeah, I totally agree right. with that. And mm -hmm. yes, I am too of Caribbean descent. So girl, I, I get exactly right. what you're talking about. <laughs> right. Down to the right. You, you, know, <laughs> you know, right, right, right. And I, I've had times, you know, it wasn't easy for me. It, it was a challenge, you know, getting to where I am today. And I'm grateful for my experience. But you know, I, I do understand what it's like you know, I, I, now that I look back, I understand what it's like, especially as some, as a Caribbean um, American, you know, you're living in the United States, but you're raised in a Caribbean home and the values might be a little different. Yes. You know, I remember actually going to a church. I used to sing in a group and one of the girls um, studied business. The other one, she was studying nursing at the time. And of course I had my MBA and I was working full time and we went to go sing um 
and for their father that was preaching. And I remember him introducing us. And, you know, when he introduced the, the one who was in business school, there was like one or two amens. When he introduced me, he was like, oh, she graduated and she's working in the name of Jesus. And, you know, a couple more said amen. But when he said, oh, we have this young nursing student, the church erupted in cheers. Oh so God. I'm really like, and she's still in school. She's just a nursing student. But I look back on it and I'm like y'all were really shady I worked hard and got this Mm -hmm. master's and it's like I don't even matter because I was in business and he didn't even he glossed over the whole business thing because it really doesn't matter they don't care she graduated and she's working that's the point yeah Um, but it's it's all to say you know you can't you can't get intimidated by it you know I've gotten comments about um, you know, what I'm going to do, what are you going to do with it? It's not marketable. You're going to end up working for a pyramid company or an insurance company. Um, but you know, you, if, if you know, again, if you know what your purpose is, you know what you're meant to do, it even puts you in a better position to look for opportunities, right? Right. Because now you're more open to saying, okay, I would love to learn about what you do, right? I'm in business school. Um, and I know it's really broad, but I want to know what you do in accounting. I want to know what you do in finance. I want to know what you do in marketing. And then based on that, you can see, oh, okay, I'm more of an analytical person. Oh, I'm more of a creative. And then you can find your niche that way. So. Yeah, definitely. That's great advice. So um, you have a lot of balls in the air. You're mm-hmm. doing a lot. What do you look forward the most to doing every day when you get up professionally? Making a difference. Making a difference and putting a smile on someone's face, being kind to somebody. I always get, um, I mean, I don't get laughed at, but it's, it's the Juliet thing where, you know, usually you send a professional email and it's, it's just a tense day, right? Good morning. Hello. And for me, I'm like, happy Wednesday. And it's every meeting. Do you have any comments, Juliet? No, but happy Wednesday, everyone. And I realized professionally, honestly, we just, we need to relax. We just need to remember our humanity. Yeah. So when it comes to my professional life, I, what I look forward to is just spreading that positive energy, you know, allowing people to step out of being so stuck and rigid all the time and just being human. Um, And outside of that, professionally, I look forward to making a difference, doing something, even if it's in the smallest way, but it makes a difference, whether it's to my organization, whether it's to my colleagues, whether it's to myself. So Mm, I love it, Julia. So um, tell us before I ask you to share, you know, where we can buy your book and how we can keep up with all of your fabulous things. I want to know a little bit about your eyewear. I saw some images and it's really cool. Thank you. So tell us about that. Yes. So um, (laughs) Nuri Lens, that is actually, it really was a solution that came about that also has a story but it really was a solution that came about as just um, a piggyback to Junuri to support students and professionals who sit for hours and hours in front of their computers and this was pre-COVID that the idea came up with that the idea came about Um, because I know for myself you know um, even driving into work I would spend you know eight hours you know in DC in the office and then I would come home and I would not come home, but I would go, you know, work with my students and that takes some computer time sometimes. And then I would have to come home and work on school and everything like that and different projects related to the business. So it's just a lot of screen time and that's just the world we're in. So that's really what the collection, the intention was. And wood was just a way of differentiating myself. I noticed that, you know, there are wood glasses, but they're not as popular as the plastic glasses or the metal glasses. Um, so I, I went with wood and, and, you know, just based on the mission and vision, um, Junuri's, uh, mission and vision is empowering students and professionals to achieve the highest standard of their purpose. Um, and I always say purpose, not, uh, potential because potential is man-made, right? That's why they say you don't get into relationships. You don't get into friendships off of potential. Um, because sometimes the person won't achieve that potential, but your purpose is always yours, no matter what. And so, you know, wood, when you look at its significance, you think of a tree, right? That's deeply rooted. 
um, it's deeply rooted and then it evolves, it grows. And so the tree represents growth. It represents knowledge. It represents wisdom. And so the wood essentially is a way of representing that for the customers as well. And even when you look at the case, it looks like it's a treasure chest and it says, see through the lens of your purpose. So it's basically almost like my blessing and a challenge to my customers that every time they open up that case um, and they put on their glasses, they're stepping into a, a treasure or an experience and they can see their purpose, no matter what it is, whether they're you know on their computer, whatever part or aspect in their life they are but they're really able to envision their purpose and they're able to continue to push and push and push towards it. Um, so that's basically what Nuri Lens is and what it represents. Um, but, you know, we have some interesting styles. Um, of course, I absolutely love glasses. So it's very much a reflection of um, some of my personality um, and a little bit of the flair that I bring um, to my style. Um, and, you know, it's, it's nice to see that um, other people like it too. So yeah. Yeah, it's definitely cool. And you also do prescriptions too, right? Absolutely. Yes, we do. We take prescriptions, we do single vision and progressive. Um, and if you don't have a prescription, we take those too. So we have a blend of both customers, both types of customers. Nice. That's really awesome. So um, Nuri, is that what is, does that mean something? Is there a bigger meaning for that word? And I'm glad you pointed that out. Yes. So when <laughs> I when I worked in um, South Korea, I don't tell this story um, anymore. But when I worked in South Korea, at the end of my term, my pastor, who was also the director of the school I worked at, he had given me the name Nanuri, the Korean name, which is which means to share mm -hmm. in Korean. And he commissioned me to share my gift wherever I would go. Oh, and so, yeah. So Na is the family name in, because in, in Asian culture, the last name comes first. So Na would be the last name and Nuri would be my first name. And so, um, you know, I came back to the States and I was like, oh, okay. I can combine this with my government name, Juliet. So, you know, you may notice on my social media profiles, I'll put Juliet Nuri Nelson um, and in the company, the company's names, you know, Nuri floats around a lot. So that's really cool. I love yeah. that. Yeah. Well, it was such a pleasure having you on the podcast. Thank you so much for coming on. Please tell us where we can purchase your book, where we can find you on social media and all of the stuff that you got going on. Absolutely. And thank you so much for having me. So you can visit my website um, and it has the links to everything. JulietNuriNelson.com. Juliet spelled J-U-L-I-E-T-T-E. -T -T -E. Nuri spelled N as in Nancy, U R as in Robert, I. Um, Nelson spelled N-E-L-S-O-N. -E I almost forgot how to spell my last name. <laughs> um, JulietNuriNelson.com. It has the link to Junuri, to Junuri Publishing and to Nuri Lens. Um, if you want to access Nuri Lens directly, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, we're on Facebook, we're on LinkedIn, and you can just search Nuri Lens and it will pop up. And if you want to go to our website, it is NuriLens.co. Um, and as in Nancy, U-R-I-L as in Larry, E, and as in Nancy, S as in so Sally. NuriLens.co. Oh, and the book, um, Sharing My Lens, The College Experience. That is on Amazon. It's on Barnes and Nobles, Kobo Books, and Apple Books, I believe. But also you can find that on JulietNuriNelson.com. So.